hugging them, by being kind and showing love to other people, and by being nice to them. Ah, uh, what? Um, you can help someone. Um, and you can also help someone walk by caring by helping them with their uh, uh, work that needs to be done. When I feel sad, sometimes a friend at school helps me feel better. They give me a hug by giving them some awesome presents. By giving, I like giving a lot, and um, I am kind. I try to be uh, really kind to my friends and my family. Um, by <coughs> taking time to get the work good present. At school, if somebody needs my help, I just help them. Like if they need help building a snowman, then I'll help them. If they need help pulling their sled up the hill, some of the sleds are actually really heavy. And like, helping them get books off the ground, or if their water bottle spills. Ugh, it always happens. I like hugs and kisses. Having the kids been great? That's been awesome. Uh, we've got one more for you on Christmas Eve, so I hope you will join us on the 24th at either a 4 o'clock or 6 o'clock service. And one of the things uh, that I love about our Christmas offering is that so much of the money that we are uh, hoping to raise is going to go to help kids, not just here, but around the world. And uh, I love the heart that Forward Church has for kids. So thank you, church, for loving kids and, and for being a place where kids can be embraced and be a part of the community. Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. It's one of my absolute favorite passages in the whole Bible. Cannot wait to, to go through this this morning. This morning is a communion Sunday, and so if you're joining us online, just invite you to uh, maybe put a pause for a second and grab some juice, some grape juice, and some bread, and be ready to join us in that. And because it's a communion Sunday, this is also the Sunday where we welcome uh, new members who have been uh, voted into membership. So want to uh, welcome this morning into membership Robin Manvalen and Jennifer Samuelson. And so welcome to membership. Love to have you as part of our Forward Church family. Does anyone know what the most popular days of the year to get engaged are. I'll give you a shot to yell out one of the three most popular days. There's, there's three of them I'm going to look for. Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day, okay, we got one. Christmas, I heard. I'm here in New Year's. Christmas is one of them. New Year's, New Year's Eve. Christmas Eve is the third. I, I did hear somebody say Christmas Eve. So if you got Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, and Valentine's Day, uh, give yourself a pat on the back. Also, among the most popular times of the year to end a relationship, <laughs> two weeks before Christmas. <laughs> Just because you get out of the awkward family stuff, right? And you don't have to get a gift, so double bonus. Uh, if you are with somebody today that you are dating or engaged to, congratulations, you have made it through for now. <laughs> I think you're probably safe until about two weeks before Valentine's Day at this point. <laughs> Why am I mentioning this? Because as we come to the fourth Sunday in Advent, the fourth Sunday, the theme of that Sunday is love. We've called our Advent series Follow the star, and the reason that we called it follow the star is because the star symbolizes a search, right? It symbolizes the search of the magi, of the wise men, as they are going to search for King Jesus. And we've talked through this series about how our lives are so often defined by and driven by a search, 
for hope and joy and peace and love. And so we've been marking, I don't know if you've noticed, is we've added new stars each week on the wall. And so each star marking a journey on our search. And on Sunday or on Saturday for a Christmas Eve service, we are going to have an even bigger star placed up above as we talk about searching for a king. But some of you, your lives are defined right now by searching, right? And we've talked about searching for hope, that some of you have been driven, your lives right now are driven in, in searching for something that makes life worth living, searching for something that will not let you down. Searching for peace, maybe this morning, that's where your search lies, that you've been searching for peace in the midst of conflict in your life and You've been looking for something and you've been saying, well, if I could just find this or I could just have this, I could just change my circumstance in this way or I could just extract myself from this situation. But what I really need in my life is peace. Maybe it's been a search for joy where you just, you just keep looking to the next purchase or the next experience or the, the next relationship to give you kind of a hit of happiness in your life. And I just, I would just say, like, all of us have these driving needs in us. We have a drive inside to experience hope and peace and joy. And if you want to, maybe you haven't been here for a you want to go and check out any of the past messages, they're online at forwardchurch.ca. You can check them out. But as strong as those desires for hope and for peace and for joy are, I think... Our desire, our need, our drive to have and experience love trumps them all. It was the Beatles who said, all you need is love, right? Love is all you really need. That like if, for some of us, if we just knew that there was at least one person out there that we matter to, that as long as there's at least one person out there who who cares about me, who esteems me, who actually wants to be with me for me, who actually wants to spend time with me. Someone who, who will stick by me when things get tough, who I can count on and trust in and know that they will never leave my side. For many of us, so much of our life is driven looking for that type of love, looking for the one, right? Or the next one. Or the good enough one. Some of us have had lives whose trajectories have been totally altered and transformed because Somebody who we thought had loved us in that way didn't love us how we thought they loved us. And so we've experienced rejection, sometimes deep trauma in our lives by people who have claimed to love us and have loved us poorly. We have this deep longing where we are really searching for love, but not just any type of love. See, I think the love that we have and that we need is a love where we're not just loved, but we're fully loved. And to be fully loved is to be fully known. That somebody actually sees us for us, they see everything about us, and instead of running away from us, they still run towards us. You know, I get a lot of Christmas cards from people. And if you gave me a Christmas card, thank you for your Christmas card. Uh, very thankful for kind words and encouragement. But I'm telling you, like, I could get a thousand Christmas cards. Everyone in this room and everybody listening online, you could all send me a Christmas card. But if Amanda and my kids decided they'd not, rather not spend Christmas with me, all those Christmas cards from people who sort of know me wouldn't mean much at all. Tim Keller says, to be loved but not known is comforting, but superficial. 
And to be known and not loved is our greatest fear. Some of us in our search for love, having been known and then not loved, have settled for that superficial love, for just superficial approval, for pretending. And some of us, I have a deep fear that if anyone really knew us, like they knew us, us, they knew us the way we knew us. They knew the parts of us that we wish nobody would ever know. That if they knew that, then they would never truly love us. They would reject us. And so before people can reject us, we reject them and push them away and keep them at arm's length. And one of the reasons why today's passage is one of my absolute favorites in all of scripture is because it tells us that the love we long for, where we would be both fully known and fully loved, is available to us and it's found in Jesus. And that's really the message of Christmas. That those of us, us as human beings who are searching for love, that at Christmas love came searching for us. So let me read this passage. Starting in verse four. But God, whenever you read those two words, by the way, we're always about to hear some incredibly encouraging news. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God. It's not a result of work so that no one can boast. First thing that we see about the type of love that God makes available to us through Jesus is that God's love through Christ is unconditional. Paul starts by painting this kind of Wonderful, but also like gross picture for us. He says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. I'm going to put up a picture of my dog shadow. They're going to put up a picture of my dog shadow on the screen. Man, he's just like the best dog. I love that dog so much. He is my football companion. He will be on my lap, taking up all my lap and half the couch today while I watch football this afternoon. I get home. He comes running to the door. His tail is wagging. Uh, He's coming up on nine years old, though. And so I've probably, if I'm lucky, I've got another five years with him. Now, here's what you need to know. When Shadow dies, I'm not going to keep his corpse around. Maybe some of you are into like the whole stuffing animals thing. If that's your deal, hey, that's cool. But I'm telling you, (laughs) I love the alive, the tail wagging, the face licking, the food stealing, the running through the woods version of Shadow. Dead Shadow, not so much. Because dead shadow won't do anything but stink and get really smelly. When it says that God in his great love for us loved us when we were dead in our trespasses, you know what that means? God loved you and I when all we did was stink. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, we had done nothing could offer nothing, in no way were worthy of love when we had done everything, in fact, to deserve his rejection, his punishment, and his wrath. That's what verse three says. When we get to but God, right before that, it says that we were actually by nature children of wrath, that on our own, what we deserved is judgment and punishment, but God, 
in his great love and mercy for us. See, God knows you. God knows me. Someone once told me, never get engaged to someone until you've seen them sick first. <laughs> it, it, some of you can, can give a hearty amen to that, right? Because when somebody is sick, all the window dressing and all the pretending and all the effort goes out the window because all you can do is just try and crawl out of bed. Most of us are at our worst when we're sick. God has seen you at your absolute worst. I want to tell you this morning, you are not hiding anything from God. There is nothing that you have done, could do, ever will do that is hidden from him. There is no thought of yours that he is not aware of. You can hide stuff from everybody else. From the person who is absolutely the closest person to you in the world, whether that's a spouse or a best friend, you have the ability to hide it. You have the ability to push thoughts away and never let anybody know about them. But you cannot hide from God. That thing that you hope that nobody else ever finds out about, that thought that you have, that thing that you've done, that you hope, like if anyone else ever found out about that, everyone else in the world would run away from you. God knows it and he still ran towards you. Because he loves you. God's love is so great that even though he has seen you at your absolute worst, when you weren't just sick, man, you were dead. While you were sinning, while you were spitting in his face, while you were rebelling against him, while you were rejecting him, when you wanted nothing to do with him, he was willing to do whatever it took to get to you. He loved you. In any other human relationship, man, in any human relationship, there is a point of no return. I don't care how strong your relationship is with somebody else. There is something, there is a line that could be crossed in which the other person says, nope, that's it, done. I'm out. The, the only point of no return with God is physical death. This side of death, a relationship with God and experiencing his love is available to you through Jesus Christ. As long as you are breathing breath, you are able to receive the love that God has made an offer to you through Jesus. So listen, stop running away from him and start running towards him. He is not waiting there to punish you. If you turn from where you're going, he is waiting there to embrace you. God's love is unconditional. The second thing we see about God's love is that the love God offers us through Christ is unearned. Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. It's by grace you have been saved. It's one thing to say that God's love is unconditional that he's, he's seen me at my worst and he's still willing to love me. It's another thing to say that it's unearned. See, not only does God offer us a love that we are unworthy of, he offers us a love that we can never make ourselves worthy of. See, it's not just that dead people stink. Dead people can't do anything. If a dead body starts doing something, you're in trouble. That's, not a, that's a zombie. That's what that is. What God offers us through Jesus is a love that we can never earn. There is no amount of doing that you can do in order to earn and be worthy of the, God that, the love that God offers. One of the most frequent complaints that I hear from people who are struggling with God and the nature of God is that it's just, it just, life seems unfair and God seems unfair and, 
and we want to yell out about things like, how could God allow this? It's just not fair. Why doesn't, why doesn't God do something about and fill in the blank? It's not fair. And I can't, I can't tell you why God allows and doesn't allow certain things to come into our life. I, I, I can't claim to know the mind of God in every situation. But I can tell you, I'm actually profoundly grateful for the unfairness of God. See, because if God was fair, there's no hope for me. My only hope is in the unfairness of God. That, that's what grace is. Grace says, you don't deserve this. You haven't earned this. It's the unmerited, unearned favor of God. That, that, that thank God he gives me what I didn't earn because as Paul's already made clear, what I did earn was his wrath and his judgment and his punishment. But in, in his incredible love, he gives to me what I've never earned, which is his love. It's, it's the most utterly unfair act in all of human history that Jesus steps down from heaven and glory and enters into the frailty of humanity, lives a perfect life, and then dies on the cross for the sinners who have scorned him. That, that's unbelievably unfair. Jesus born to die for sins committed against him. Sins he never committed himself. For God so loved the world. I love that little word, so. That there is this incredible extent of love. And it's, it's made visible through the fact that Jesus has come. He so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that so whoever should believe in him should not perish but have life eternal. That is the incredible, astounding, unfair, unearned love of God. For by grace you have been saved, Paul goes on to say, through faith. It's not of your own doing, it's a gift of God. It's, it's not a result of your works, it's not about anything you did. So guess what, you don't get to boast. You get to wave your flag and say, look at me, I'm a Christian, aren't I good? There is nothing that you can do to earn God's love and acceptance. Salvation is a gift, not an achievement. See, part of the evidence that you really get this reality of God's unearned love in your life is that you stop pretending about everything. You stop putting on a mask and acting like you've got it all together. My heart breaks to know that some of you have spent your entire lives walking with Jesus pretending like everything is okay. That, that you are dealing in silence on your own with sins that are destroying you from the inside out. That you're pretending and not allowing anybody to come in and see the brokenness and the hurt and the pain and the shame that you're struggling through. I want you to understand how much God loves you, how unearned his love is for you. So you can stop pretending, bring those things into the light and start finding healing. You will never get healthy until you get honest. Listen, somebody needs to hear this today. God is not looking for your perfection. He's looking for your surrender. Jesus is your perfection. He doesn't need you to make everything right. He made everything right through Jesus. He's waiting for you to repent and turn towards him and trust him in taking you on that journey of wholeness and healing. The love of God is unearned. The love of God offers us through Christ is unbelievable. Look at verse 6. It says that he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If you go through this whole passage from verse 1 through to verse 10, when you see these 
kind of uh, contrasting realities where you see we were dead, God made us alive. We deserved wrath, God offers us mercy. And I love this reality that God doesn't just make us alive. He doesn't raise us out of, the, out of the graveyard and then leave us in the graveyard. You know what he does? He raises us up out of the graveyard and then he invites us into his throne room. From the lowest low to the highest high. When it, when it talks about Christ being seated, the imagery here that Paul is putting out there is Christ on the throne in heaven and in glory. And he's saying, if you're in Christ... That's where you are now. You were dead. And now you're seated in the highest high with Christ in the throne room of glory. Now, in some crazy way, that's where you are now. That's, that's why, as, as a follower of Jesus, you have access to God through prayer because you're there with him through Christ in the throne room. You can bring your prayers and petitions to him. The love of God is such that when you accept Jesus as your Savior and Lord, he doesn't just cancel the debts that you owe. That would be astounding enough. If someone came and just said, hey, just want to cover your mortgage. Want to pay off all your bills. You're debt free. That would be reason to celebrate, amen, if someone came and told you that. But he doesn't just cover your debts. He doesn't just clear the charges against you. He cleans you up and then he invites you into the palace and he embraces you and he makes you his child. God in his great love for you doesn't simply tolerate you. He treasures you. It's incredible. And some of you have settled your whole life for relationships where you're just tolerated. God wants you to know he treasures you. When our kids were younger, every single meal, and man, I can give testimony to this, there would be a fight between our two boys over who would sit beside mom. Now, I get it. If I had to choose between Amanda and me, I know where I want to sit too. They would all, always a fight over who would sit beside her. And because I was sitting on one side, there was only one other side available. The reason that they wanted to sit beside their mom so bad was because they loved their mom. And they wanted to be in her presence, right? When it says he raised us up and seated us with him, it's because he wants us in his presence. He actually wants us there with him. If you are in Christ... And you're going through a season right now where God feels far away from you. Paul's telling you, he's right there with you. You're right there with him. Even if you can't feel it. This is a truth you have to preach to yourself. God's love is unconditional. It's unearned. It's unbelievable. One more thing, the love of God offered to us through Christ is unending. It says he raised us up with him and seated, with, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Even if you could find a love here on earth that was unconditional, was unearned, was as unbelievable as the love that God offers through Jesus. One thing would be true, and that's that at some point that love would have to end. Some of you have experienced the, the overwhelming pain of that reality and the loss. That's why it hurts so bad, right? Because life here is finite. There is a, there's a beginning date and an end date. But the life we're offered through Jesus is unending and so is his love. I, I, I just love this. He loves us. He rescues us. He makes us alive. He seats us up in the front of the room. Why? So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Somebody told me the other day, I'm, I'm a little worried about heaven. 
I said, what are you worried about? He said, well, I'm a little worried that it's going to be boring. I mean, like, forever is a really long time. I love this because right here, God paints a picture of what forever is like with him. It looks like immeasurable grace and kindness poured out on us for all eternity. Earlier this week, I don't know if you saw this, Elon Musk lost the title of richest man. He's now worth only a paltry $164 billion. Everybody feels really sad for Elon, I'm sure. We want you to imagine that you bump into Elon, you start chatting. Maybe you say to him, hey, Elon, maybe lay off the tweets a little bit. He says, hey, thanks for that. Uh, Because of your advice to me, I've decided that I'm going to spend all of my money, all of my riches to show you as much kindness as I can show you for the rest of my life. Would that be all right, right? It's better than having my mortgage paid off. Do you know that Elon's $164 billion are a single pebble in the sand of the riches of our Lord? And more than that, sooner or later, his life ends, my life ends. Paul says in the coming ages, in all of eternity, that it will take all of eternity for God to run out of ideas on how to pour out his kindness and grace to you. You want to know what heaven's like? It's forever of God just coming up with new ways to pour out his love and grace and kindness on you. You know, Jesus came at Christmas, not so we had a great excuse to give presents to one another. He came at Christmas to demonstrate his great love for us. It's a love that loves the real you. The realest you, the parts of you that you haven't even got real with yourself about. He he was not tricked or fooled into loving you. He didn't He's never going to have buyer's remorse. He knew exactly what he was getting into when he chose you. It's a love that is unearned. You didn't do anything to earn it, which means you can't do anything to lose it. It's a love that's unbelievable. The, the, The God that you and I have run from, spit on, mocked, rebelled against, told him we want nothing to do with, came and died for you and I. We couldn't come to him, so he came to us. We deserve death, but he comes and dies to bring us life. We deserve wrath, and instead he offers to make us his kids. It is a love that is unending. I want to read to you the full quote from Tim Keller that I started this message with. To be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known but not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It's what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense. It humbles us out of our self-righteousness And it fortifies us for any difficulty that life can throw at us. This is the love that you've been searching for. It's the love that you and I need. Even the greatest human loves are but imperfect shadows of the love that God offers to you and I. When you call God Father, all of our understandings of God's love for us as a parent are shadowed through our own parents and none of our own parents were perfect but God is the perfect father and if you haven't had the parents that you maybe wish you had or ought to have, they didn't love you the way that you deserve to be loved, God loves you in a way they never could. We talk about marriage later on in the same book in Ephesians 5.32. Paul says that this 
love in marriage between a husband and a wife is a picture of Christ in the church. That a perfect marriage is a full reflection of the incredible love that God has for his people. If you want to know how to improve your marriage, love like Jesus. And here, here's what I, I need you to know more than anything else. The love that God is offering through Christ is available to you and I today. Some of you have been in church a long time. Maybe heard a million messages on love. Maybe you're even a really faithful follower of Jesus today. But you need to hear again, God loves you. God loves you. It's, it's, not, I'm, it's not trite. You need to know this in your soul. God loves you. He doesn't love some idealized version of you. He doesn't love some version that you will be in the future. He loves you. He loved you when there was absolutely nothing lovely about you. Part of God's love is that he loves us so much that he meets us where we are. But he also loves us so much that he won't leave us there. He, he wants to take us along in the journey. And some of you are fighting him in that this morning because you don't actually trust his love enough. You've got a decision that you're up against where you're not leaning into him. You don't trust him. You got a sin that you're struggling with where deep down at the root, the struggle is you don't actually believe that God has told you to do something or not do something because he loves you. And so you need to know that he loves you because if God loves you as much as we've talked about today, how can you not trust him? Some of you have never actually received the love of Jesus. You've never got to the point where you have said, yes, I believe God loves me so much he sent his son to die for me. And I understand that apart from Jesus and what he did for me, I am a child of wrath, deserving of God's judgment, deserving of hell. I, I get that this love that he offered is available through Jesus only. It's not something that I work up and earn. There's no list of things that I do to make God loves me. He loved me as much as he could possibly love me through Christ. If that's where you're at today and you want to experience the love of God in your life through Jesus, I just want you to know it's available to you today so that you can experience it now and in the ages to come. What I want to do this morning, I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And as people are bowing their heads and closing their eyes, I just ask you, Maybe you're a follower of Jesus who just needs to know afresh today God's love for you. If that's you, just put up your hand. I want to be able to pray for you this morning. And Thanks, I see those hands. I just want to pray over you that you would know God's love in your soul. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never actually come to a point where you said, I believe God loved me so much that he sent his son to die for me. And I want to receive that love that he's made available through Jesus. And if that's you today, just you can put up your hand. And I'd love to be able to pray over you in that. Thank you. Thanks. Father, thank you so much for the love that you have demonstrated us. Thank you that at Christmas we see that love made flesh. That Jesus came down from glory in heaven, was born as a frail and fragile baby, stepped into humanity, into all of our muck and mess to chase after us with a love that is unconditional and unearned and unbelievable and never ends. Father, I'm praying for each one here today who needs to feel afresh and anew your love, that they would... Just here today, they're loved by you. That, that wouldn't stay in their head, but it would move to their hearts. 
Father, for those who've put up their hand, they want to receive your love for the first time. They want to place their faith in Jesus. If that's you, just invite you to pray along with me. Father, thank you for loving me so much that you would send your son to die for me when there was nothing lovely about me, when I was dead in my sins and my trespasses. I believe that. And I believe that your grace, your unmerited favor shown to me through Jesus, through his death on the cross, I have been made perfect and holy in your sight. You no longer see all my sin and all my stain and all the unloveliness that was put on the cross with Christ. And now I am seated with you in the throne room. And my promise of that is that the stone rolled away and Jesus walked out alive on the third day. And just as Jesus walked out alive on the third day, if I've placed my faith in you, I believe that I am now alive in Christ as well. If that's your prayer today, know that you are now a child of God, loved by him, seated in the throne room and getting ready for an eternity where he is gonna pour out his kindness and grace upon you. Father, thank you for meeting us in this place with your love.